Our co-host on the day, New York Times bestselling author John Gilstrap, whose book Zero Sum dropped Tuesday of this week. I, I assume we've sold a million copies already. Five million. <laughs> Just, <laughs> Why yeah, stop absolutely. There? Why not? We can make up numbers all the time. <laughs> Why not? Uh, why not keep it going, baby? <laughs> yeah. Uh, uh, where, as far as uh, you know, your your happiness with a book when it's re when it's released. Uh, when do you go? Uh, do you, I mean, do you have target numbers for certain dates after it's released as to what you'd like to see? sales-wise, or how you know this one's going to be a, a, a good seller or not? No, because by then, I've already written another book, and I've started in, into the next one. You know, there's, I, th I think for new authors, where it's the first or second mm -hmm. book, there's there's that sort of obsession to look at sales numbers and, and all of that, which normally leads to depression. You move on. You can't, God give grant me the serenity to, you know, accept the things I cannot change. Mm -hmm. um, you just, you, you keep looking forward and, and you leave it to the people who are marketing books to, to market the books. So once you write it, it goes into the machine and you're moving on to the next. Book. Yeah. And, and, and try not, not to look back. I won't say I don't read reviews. Mm -hmm. Um, I, the smart ones like the books, and then idiots don't. But. <laughs> Let's see. You know, it's always been the case. Yeah. <laughs> we have four tickets to the WVU Penn State game, August the thirty first. Right now, uh, one thousand two hundred and fifty dollars, or a little over three hundred bucks a ticket is the bid. That's a, I understand the going rate in the secondary market uh, right now. These are section one hundred three. You can post your bid on our Facebook comment section or call uh, this uh, fine establishment at three zero four two six three six five four zero or six five eight six. And you can bid that way, too. All of the money collected from the bids goes to the Berkeley County Backpack Program, which provides food for kids to take home uh, from school, kids that otherwise might not uh, get to eat once they go home. Our next guest looks like he rode right out of a Western novel and uh, also looks like he, he may have also started in Roadhouse with the Patrick Swayze. Uh, <laughs> to Mr. Gilstrap is the man who traditionally books these interviews and introduces these guests. Our next guest is Reva Z. Wortham, who, I, full disclosure, one of my dearest friends in the world, brother from a different mother. Um, for the first time in history, I don't know how long I've, I've known Reva, it's a long, long time. Um, we've killed a lot of brain cells together um, at various conferences and such. And we'll be going to Paris. We've been to Paris, Texas together. We're going to Paris, France together here, not, uh, not too far future. Um, we were published on the same day. Had books drop on the same day last Tuesday. His cool. is um, called Broken Truth. And Rev. Z. Wortham is joining us from Prosper, Texas. Hey, how you doing, Rev? Good morning, John. Good morning, Sue. Good to see you your voice too this morning you guys sound like you've been up for several hours now already <laughs> <laughs> what you haven't <laughs> <laughs> no no i have not it's a little bit later here and, and i'm not prosper john i'm at the cabin so oh, I'm, okay. I'm out in the i'm out in far northeast texas so you're surrounded by a lot of stuffed dead, animal, dead animals right now. <laughs> there are many animals uh, on the walls around here, but there and I did not put a, one of them up. They were here when we bought this cabin, but uh, also outside there's there's a lot of wildlife around, and, and uh, it's, it's beautiful this morning. It's still it's cool. The humidity's low. I think summer is finally giving up and, and giving us a break for a little while. So, tell us about uh, Tucker Snow's latest adventure. Well, I appreciate the opportunity, and and, and on, on the other side of the coin, John, congratulations on your release. Also, this is this is great. We've never shared a, a pub date before, so this is this is pretty cool. And and hard and uh, hard country. Broken Truth is the second book in my Tucker Snow series that uh, came about when John and I were sitting around a campfire up here with a. Uh, with some friends that I, I I met several years ago that were former undercover narcotics agents for the DPS here in Texas, and uh, they were telling stories, and John and I were, were telling lies, and or no, theirs theirs were lies, and ours were the truth. John, isn't that right? I yeah, think, sure. I think that's how it was. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> anyway, we we're talking to these guys, and they gave me an idea for my first uh, Tucker Snow novel, Hard Country, and then uh, the second one, The Broken Truth, uh, popped up about halfway. through. But about the time I finished Hard Country, uh, I got the idea for this one because we bought this cabin up here, and uh, again in far uh, northeast Texas, very rural area. And the the cabin was a diamond in the rough. John saw this uh, the day we signed on. John, what was your impression of, of, this, of this land in the cabin when we bought it? What the hell is he thinking? <laughs> <laughs> Yes, everybody. Everybody thought that the captain was in bad shape. 
the land was horrible. It looked like it looked like a city dump because the man was a welder and he never threw any he never did anything to the dump. He would just take it out in the woods and throw it out. So uh six yard dumpsters later, all the all the trash is gone and, and now we are we are up here and and we got rid of most of that trash pretty easily. We just you know, we hauled it off. But we, we ran into a problem with drill rods. Uh, well, there were, he was a welder. There were a lot of drill rods that he was using, and we found out that though um, they look innocent enough, and they are uh, not truly dangerous uh, in the the amount that we had, uh, they have some radiation in them from drilling out in the West Texas uh, oil fields. And we tried to. Uh, I, John told me told me about this. And John, you you you've got a better background. Uh, with the hazardous materials than I do. You want to just tell them what you knew about these drill rods? Well, yeah, I mean, they're, they are radioactive. It's called naturally occurring radioactive material, NORM. Um, it's, it's regulated, but uh, it's, a, it's a forbidden material. It's, it's hard to get rid of. It is hard to get rid of it. Nobody would buy it. Just, just for grins, I put one, on, one of the rods on the trailer when we t- took the, one of the last loads up to sell at a, at a, at a, at a, um, uh, a yard, and uh, they put a Geiger counter on it, and it did tick and it came up, and so we knew we couldn't get rid of them uh, that way. But we use them all the time up in here. This is not something that's glowing in the middle of the night out in the pasture, out in the woods. It's just, it's just, it's just a, a, a part of drilling. And so uh, another welder came up and, and took those off my hands. But as I was thinking about those and thinking about uh, the nature of, of, of drilling and, and what people do and what governments do, I, I thought, well, you know, there are some, there are some problems out, out there if you're drilling and you're getting radioactive rods out of the ground, you're pulling them out. But what if, what if somebody had put something in the ground that wasn't supposed to be there? And that came from my dad, who was a uh, who was a former wildcatter way back in the uh, late '40s, in out in West Texas. And they were drilling out there for oil, finding it, capping it off. But sometimes they'd have dry wells, they'd have dusters. And he told me that on occasion people would uh, uh, deposit things down in these dry wells that would fit down in there that they could pump down into them. And so then, you know, like John and I, our minds are always working on what if. And I thought, well, what if somebody put some, some byproducts of uh, creating uh, atomic bombs or, or byproducts of other um, uh, other things we don't know about? What if they put some of those down into, into the ground and somebody drilled into them and then brought those rods back? They should be disposed of properly, but someone might well have put those on a trailer, sold them for scrap, and boom, here we are using it to build uh, to build things out here in northeast Texas, uh, corrals, uh, fences, you know, anything that, you could do, that a welder might build for somebody from around the house. And that's where the idea for the Broken Truth came in. The cover-up, once once the people started finding out that uh, that this radioactive material was there. So they, they, the, like John, I wrote this about a year and a half, two years ago. And I had to go back and reread a couple of parts of it when people were giving me reviews and saying they like certain parts. I went, really? Did I write that? <laughs> so this is book number, and I should tell you that if, if you haven't had an opportunity to read Revis's work, um, he's he's an underknown author, quite honestly. Um, he should be, uh, he, he does very well in Texas, and um, his, his work has been, Compared to Harper Lee, I guarantee my work has never been compared to Harper Lee. Um, he's, he's quite a stylist. He writes good action scenes, but he also does very stylistic. Um, you, you feel like you're in Texas when, when you're reading his stories and, and does, does great characterizations. The, um, so Tucker Snow is a cattle agent, right? Yes, Tucker is, is a cattle agent. He, uh, some people call him cattle cop. He, he is part of the TSCRA, the Texas uh, Cattle Association, who investigates rural crimes. And uh, Tucker, it, it, in, in the series, Tucker is a, is a gentleman who had some trouble with, uh, with losing his wife and his child to, uh, to, to drugs, the uh, victims of a, of a car wreck, someone who was under the influence of drugs. And, and Tucker had to take a break for a little while and move to the country. And he's just not getting back into uh, what passes as a normal life for someone who suffered such a tragedy. 
and then he runs into all kinds of problems in Northeast Texas that most people don't associate with uh, with uh, cattle cops and that kind of thing because um, he investigates rural crimes in both Texas and Oklahoma. They have they have uh, the power of the Texas Rangers. They can cross over and investigate uh, across the Red River in Oklahoma and make arrests. So, so uh, it, it's a unique it's a unique job. Not many people know about them. There aren't that many. Uh, officers uh, under that umbrella here in the state of Texas. It's a pretty small unit, but they cover the entire state of Texas and uh, Oklahoma. When you're writing about radiation, cattle rustling, and the like, where do you go to for expertise on a subject or subjects like well, these, Rivers? I contacted the TSCRA and talked to them. Uh, they gave me the opportunity to, to ride around with them uh, to, to do those kinds of things. And then I went to, uh, I, I reached out to people that I know that uh, that have been involved in the scrap business. There's a guy that's very close to you uh, right there, Rob, that, that knows all of these a lot of this information and the rest of it's just pure research you, you go online you talk to people at scrap yards uh, you you follow those contacts it's it's investigative but it's it's not it's not like law enforcement investigation it's just trying to track down certain details and follow and not get not get sidetracked on the rabbit trails that so easily to do, so easy to do do you try to stay as factually correct as possible when you're writing about these things or do you take a little license with some of the stuff the only thing I took license with was the radioactive material that was placed in the ground. Uh, everything else is, is true to life. Everything else is factual. Um, there's there's a shady organization <clears throat> now. There are a lot of a lot of uh, ABC organizations in, in the government. There's some shady ones that we do know about and some we don't know about. But this is a shady organization tied. Uh, the, the ones that are trying to cover up the radiation issue in uh, in, in this novel are tied to to big oil. And I, I you know what? I, I I we can get into a, a discussion pros and cons of big oil and the green energy and, and the green movement. But this is this is more about people not doing what's right as opposed to the political aspects of what's going on today. So in. Uh... I was born in 63 and sometime in the, I guess, 70s uh, with the Three Mile Island, radiation became a big fear for everybody. And of course, during the Cold War, us all being nuked was, uh, you remember duck and cover and all those drills and, and whatever, like your desk was going to stop you from nuclear fallout. Gave you something to do. Yeah, I guess. It, it's a way to keep the fidgety kids exercising, I guess, during class time so you have to sit still. But uh, why why radiation as a theme now? Is there anything going on that happened in current events that made you think this, when you wrote this a couple of years ago, this would be a good theme to, to explore in a book? Well, not, not necessarily uh, or uh, or anything local right here. It was just the fact that, that these drill rods that, that were here at, at, at the cabin that were stacked out into the woods uh, had radiation in them. And no one ever thinks about those kinds of things, that uh, that something could, could be uh, radioactive, so, something so innocent looking. And I, and I know that some guys, a lot of people, well, as a matter of fact, John, you, we had a family ranch up in Oklahoma, which was the basis for the first Tucker Snow novel, Hard Country, uh, we uh, we didn't realize that we bought this this large cattle ranch right that was right across a gravel road about 300 yards down from a, a meth house, and that was a that was a problem for all of us, which sparked the first Tucker Snow, which was hard country. But there was we had we had a fence around the we built a fence around the uh, the, the the ranch house up there, the main house, and it was built out of of uh, scrap. Materials like the, that, the posts were not drill posts, but they, they'd been used uh, for other things before they put them in. And then the cables were the cables that people used uh, in, in the ocean to, uh, um, uh, yeah, I, I, honestly, I don't know exactly what those cables were for. They, they were used cables. They had been used in some marine activity, and then they were repurposed for uh, for a fence up there. So um, with all that, you know, like all writers – we're always casting around for, for information or, or ideas and all that kind of gel together. When I found those, we found those rods out in, in the woods, we had to do something with them and nobody, nobody would even touch them except some, some welders up there. And, they, and these guys have been building things with, with those rods for, for decades. They don't think a thing about it because as by themselves, the rods are not, are not truly dangerous, but 
I wanted to amp that up. And so to make them dangerous, I drilled into to, uh, some, some, uh, some refuse out in uh, at the people who dispose of out in West Texas. And that, that's kind of the spark for the entire idea. You know, as an aside here, because this is some of the absurdity. We talk about regulations and such on this, on this program. There is no law, certainly not in Texas and in, in, in the vast majority of states, there is no law that says a scrapyard has to have radiation detection at the scale where things comes across, come across, which means you can take radioactive anything into a scrapyard and get paid for it or get dumped in the pile and it will go wherever it goes without any penalty. However, if a scrapyard decides to put radiation detection on it and they detect the radiation and then they accept it, there are huge fines for that scrapyard. So there's <laughs> you're penalized for actually doing the right thing. So it, it, it's <laughs> welcome, welcome to the U.S. regulatory environment. <laughs> Um, I want to say um, there's there's an organization called Kirkus Reviews that hates every book that they ever read. And uh, it says of, of The Broken Truth, the leading characters include perfect heroes, dastardly villains, in-betweeners, conspirators who mix virtuous and evil impulses, and free agents who can turn on a dime from bad guys to good, part Western, part mystery, all action. Um, that's, that's, that's not a sucky review, Rev. Um, but it, it does tee up something else. You've done some, you, uh, you sort of pursued a childhood dream recently, went back and wrote some, um, true Westerns. You know what, Dan, that's the truth. Before I get to that, John, I want to thank you to though, because getting to know you and reading your thrillers made me want to write thrillers because I was, a, originally I was writing, uh, mysteries. And and that got me into knowing you got me into writing thrillers and they're they're a roller coaster ride they're a lot of fun they're fast action but yeah um, I, all, I I cut my teeth on Louis Lamore and Max Brand and, and and I would like to say Zane Gray but because I'm named my middle name is Zane and I'm named after Zane Gray but I can't read the man but uh, <laughs> his work but I was I was huge and I still am a, a fan of westerns and I had the opportunity recently to write westerns. Uh, through Kensington, uh, John's publisher, and, and mine also for my uh, for another series that I write, and so I've I've written a couple of westerns now. That one one is out, and another one will be out uh, very soon. The one that the one that's released only right now in uh, as an ebook is The Journey South, and it's a, it's a pure western. And I've written a sequel to that, The Only Saloon in Town, which is going to come out in a couple of months. But at the same time, here here here's the weirdness about me. I also I also love different genres, and I just uh, I just signed a contract for two more westerns. Uh, one is called Comancheria. It will be out in twenty five, and and this series is western horror, which is a whole other world and more fun. It, it is more fun to write than you can imagine. And so yesterday, John, I I finished up the second one. I, I typed those wonderful two words that John I love so much, read in, and wrapped up the second uh, the second book in that series. And so with that, I have and not not yet completely published, but with that, I've I've written uh, and have in the queue twenty books. So I've, I've been pretty excited about that. It's it's been a fast paced career once i once i launched it so many years ago the year i met you john in, in florida and and with comancheria interesting backstory there because for, and for burgeoning writers out there who who feel discouraged comancheria was unpublishable according to some because it was cross genre everybody loved it but there's no way anybody was going to buy this book right it was never going to come out <clears throat> Yeah, yeah. It, it, I, I wrote it. It was a COVID dream. It really was. It was a true dream. I dreamed it from beginning to end one night. Got up uh, the next morning in the middle of COVID, sat down and wrote uh, about the first five or six, seven thousand words before lunch. And because all I was doing is writing what I had seen in, in, in that dream. And I, I, I finished that one up really quickly. And everyone, everyone told me that this is, this is a horrible idea. It's, it's going to be a horrible book. Even my wife, who is my first reader, uh, she's a beta reader, and, she, and I gave it to her. I said, "Just read it and see if you're going to like it." And she was actually laughing and snickering and having a gr great time with it. When she finished, she handed me the manuscript back, and she said, "This is great. You have to, you have to continue on with this." So, no one, but no one would touch it. None of my, none of my publishers would uh, take a look at it at all. They all turned me down. 
I went to Colorado to a writer's conference up there, met a publisher who, and, and here, here's something that, that's going to gnaw on me for the rest of my life. I described it. The publisher agreed. He liked the idea. We shook on it. Uh, I came home thinking we had a contract, and two days later he crawfished on the idea and said he wasn't going to touch it. Yeah, and then I grew up up here in this part of the world. Uh, a handshake is a contract, as far as I am concerned. And my granddaddy borrowed money from a bank on a, on a handshake and paid it back with interest. But this guy, this guy backed out on it, which would have discouraged, like you said, beginning writers or, or first time writers. But it just, it just built fire under me. And I was at another writers conference last October. Met a, a, a up and coming publisher with a great track record. And uh, the company is uh, Roan and Weatherford. They loved it. They're more behind this book than they're behind anything else that I've written. So Comancheria is going to come out soon, and, and, and we're all excited about that, too. So you know, The Broken Truth is a thriller. Uh, it, it, it's, a, it's a contemporary Western thriller, but now I'm writing Westerns and uh, Western horror novels. So this is a great second career for me. It's, it's been fun, and, and it, it's, been a, it's been a great ride. And I'm looking forward to even, you know, even more adventures in this thing with John. My, and in and, and the publishing world. I have a question for you, Revis. Is cattle rustling still a thing? Oh, it is. It is. A lot of it's high tech now. There are people are selling cattle on, on the Internet that are not theirs and then, and, and then picking it up. But people are still uh, they're still backing trailers up to uh, to some of these some of these play. A lot, there's a, there are a lot of weekend uh, cowboys, weekend farmers, weekend ranchers. And they're folks that live in, in town, but they have land out here. They keep it in ag. Uh, keep cows on it for 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 the tax purposes, and uh, they don't get out as often as they should. And so it, it's pretty easy for these guys that, that cruise these gravel roads, and these asphalt roads out here, uh, oil roads, to notice that uh, there's not a lot of activity. And they pop a lot, back a trailer up, and load them up. Uh, you can't sell them to to the sale barns. And that, that's what the, uh, the the brand inspectors do. And that's what the cattle cops do. They watch those sales and keep a really close eye on them. But, you know, the bad people find each other. And so it would be easy to uh, for an unscrupulous uh, uh, person to steal a trailer full of cattle, take it somewhere else, sell it to somebody, and, and take it out in their back pasture and let them out. Do they still brand cattle with the ranch's uh, insignia? People do still brand them, but a lot of people don't. There, you know, again, there's, you know, you have a calf drop, and uh, you're not out here very often. Are you going to wait and keep putting things off, and so somebody can come up and just, you know, just lead them into a pen, cut them out, put them on in trailers, and take off. It, it, people can steal anything, even if it's nailed down. I, I can attest to that fact because with hard touch, that's where that came from. The meth people they they needed uh, they needed money to buy their meth, so they would break into the ranch house that we had up in Oklahoma, and uh, still still pots, pans, little stuff out of there. Part of it was to cook the meth, but the other part was you know they would they would steal saddles or, or whatever is, is in the ranch or generators or or whatever might be in a barn, and sell that from they stole the the my, my brother in law's truck that stayed there by the ranch house. Uh, it, was, it was a, a one-ton one ton dually. When they 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 wired it up, they tried to drive it through that uh, through a pipe gate. And if you've ever seen a pipe gate, they're they're setting the ground hard. So they hit it a few times, couldn't get through there. Then they backed up, drove around, and went through a barbed wire fence um, uh, at some distance away, and then drove straight over to the meth house to uh, <laughs> to, to, to sell what they'd stolen. It's important to remain focused. <laughs> yeah. Rev, we got we got to say it's important to remain focused. Yeah, uh, on your goal. <laughs> well, hey, we got to we got to we got to get to the commercial break. Revis, uh, thanks so much. The, the book is called The Broken Truth. We appreciate your time this morning, as always, sir. Uh, man, I tell you what, Rob, Rob, I appreciate you, John. I will see you next week. See you next week, week, buddy. All right. Have a great Thank day. Thanks for the opportunity, guys. Bye bye. Revis Wortham and uh, Z. By the way, uh, the whole cattle rustling thing. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm probably the only one in the room whose family actually did that at one point. <laughs> yeah, right. Back in the 1800s, my family. Cattle rustlers. Really? No lie. Yeah. yeah.